already and putting it into perspective about you know healthy diets and fads and fats. So what I'm going to cover today is about fad fad diets and food trends. Um, I have cut my presentation a little bit short around the fad food trends, just so I can capture a little bit about the media release on the type 2 diabetes diet as well. So I just wanted to touch a little bit on that. Won't have time to go into detail, but I'll be around afterwards if you want to talk. Um, oops, I've gone backwards. So my 45 minutes will consist of really fad food diet picks and fad food trends. What I won't talk about is the pills and potions. Um, the role of fad diets in any eating disorders or specific needs for chronic disease at this stage, but I will allude to the diabetes diet. But before I get started, what I want to talk about is my journey. Um, personally, I've um, got a sister in Port Augusta who's recently started the gluten-free diet, and she came to me with this amazing, um, I guess, experience and came to me and said, look, Penny, you know what? I feel so much better. I've lost 10 kilos. I'm, you know, no more bloating. I'm feeling really, really well on this gluten-free diet. She's not celiac, by the way. And she saw me after Christmas and she said, you know what, you put on a couple of kilos. Why don't you try it? So I looked at her sideways and thought, you know, why, why not? Why don't I try it? So I've been on the gluten-free diet now for about two months. Okay, and I love it. It's fantastic. It's good. And I can hear the noise now, it's gone really quiet. So I'm going to get you to stop for a minute and think, is she telling me the truth? <laughs> All right. Who's whispering about that? Did she really do it? <laughs> um, it's not true. I didn't do a fad diet. Oh, you can breathe a sigh of relief now. I didn't. Um, but it's so easy to stand here as a professional with CSIRO, expert and with an expert team underneath with us, I'm talking about fads and trends and be a really confident speaker and say, this is what I do and have everybody believe us. What I want you to get out of today is what's happening out there, having a look at the science and just taking away some key messages that there's not one diet that fits all. So I've only got time to cover off on a few diets. Oops, I keep pressing the backwards button. <laughs> um, but first, I want to put into your heads what a fad diet is. So it says here, a fad diet is an intense and widely shared enthusiasm, as you would have experienced by me with that, my daughter, um, my sister's experience, or fake experience, um, for something especially that is on a short, that is has a benefit for short term and without objective basis or with the scientific evidence. Um, for example, the weight loss plans is where we're going to come from here today. And a myth is a legend or a tradition without defined facts. I just want to put the, that piece of that clarity in perspective as well. So this little key point here is really um, fad diets. In science, we find fad diets kind of annoying, um, but not annoying in the sense that we don't want to look at it, we don't want to understand it. We find it a little bit all-encompassing because there's no way to define a fad diet. There's so many variables out there. There's so many different paleo diets, different low-carbohydrate, high-protein diets. There's so many out there. And I can tell you I've found seven, eight paleo diets, seven um, Mediterranean diets, and around about a gazillion protein and high fat, low carb variations. So, I can't cover them all today, but I'm just going to try and give you an overall perspective. Um, so, it is difficult to obtain funding for research, and that's one of the reasons why we don't do a lot of heavy research in sub subjectively looking at um, the effects of the paleo diet because there are so many variations and we have to select one, so it's hard to get funding. And that's one of the reasons why you don't see a lot of research substantiating some of these claims because they're just so ambiguous. And a lot of the times that some of these fad diets are quite prescriptive and dismissive of behaviours and we were talking earlier about stress and stress management having an influence on dietary choices as well. So we, it is quite a broad area that fad diets aren't beneficial all by themselves. They are, you need to look at dietary intake in the perspective of the whole environment. So why are we interested in this area? This says a lot. I think you can tell that you know, with all the diet books, with they are going down as well, there is a trend in decrease of purchasing cookbooks. Um, but there is no surprise that we are spending so much on um, you know, cookbooks, fad diets. So we are spending you know, 6.6 .6 billion is our expected expenditure. And, um, and it's mainly on self-help book and weight loss and service pills and diets and so forth. 
What this tells us as researchers, though, is that it's actually we've got an increased health consciousness. People are wanting to know more information, but the, but the information, how it comes out to you, is through social media, probably not the right avenues. It would be great if everybody attended event, um, events like this and hear lovely Velma talk about fats. I've learned so much from that. But it would be great to have education in a meaningful way. And unfortunately, the way media releases information and how we have to sift through a lot of the anecdotal information and personal experience information can lead to a term called orthorexia, where people are now becoming more obsessed with eating healthier than they ever have before. This isn't a new term. This is a term that's been around by, in 1997 by US, it's a US medical professional called Steve Bratman who defined the term orthorexia, which is the obsession to eat healthy. And you may see that in your own culture, in your own exposures, where people are saying, you shouldn't eat this, you should eat that. And they're looking at the nutrients rather than the, the whole variable of life and diet interaction. So fads, we'd love you to give you a, an answer to this question. So what I hope to look at is it overrated or understated. So giving the evidence is um, one of the ways I want to get you to, I guess, think creatively yourselves and think critically about what this might mean to you. So my aim today is really to provide an overview of key scientific evidence um, regarding the safety of some of these diets. But really we've had the dietary guidelines for some time. How many of you are actually familiar with the dietary guidelines? Hands up. I know there's more of you out there. <laughs> we've had them for some time and re recently um, they've been re-released, probably 2014, and the latest release provides a wide range of acceptable macronutrients. Now macronutrients come from what we know, protein, fats and carbohydrates. We do, I haven't got it up there, but alcohol, 5% of the daily intake is also within that acceptable range. And these all contribute to dietary energy intake. Outside of these ranges that are listed up here, the risk of chronic disease, overweight and obesity and inadequate micronutrient intake may increase. Um, but there's insufficient data available at extreme ends of the population. So we're looking at the healthy individual predominantly within these ranges of macronutrients listed up here. Okay, so protein, and it's a wide range when you think about it. So I want you to think when I start talking about the types of diets that I'll be um, showing you today, there's three of them, three types, um, I want you to think about back to this, where do they fit? So the range for protein acceptability is 15 to 25 grams um, percent of the total energy intake per day. So it's quite a wide range. The carbohydrates, 45 to 65%, again, a nice wide range. And total fats, 20 to 35%. And we already know through Velma's talk that the types of fats are the really important. I haven't broken it down into this presentation, but making sure a lot of the fats that you have come from your MUFAs or your PUFAs. Underpinning the dietary guidelines are what we call the, the um, sorry, the acceptable reference ranges for nutrients are the guidelines. There's five key principles now for this talk. I've left out breastfeeding and food safety for obvious reasons and I've just come back down to these top three. So to achieve and maintain a healthy weight, be physically active and choose amounts of nutritional food and drinks to meet your energy needs. So keeping in mind you're aiming for those nutrient targets but we are trying to underpin those nutrient targets by these choices. So enjoy a wide variety of foods from the five food groups every day. Eat plenty of vegetables, fruits, grains, lean meats, nuts, legumes, dairy and dairy alternatives and limit foods high in saturated fat, added salt and sugars and alcohol. Okay. So pretty simple, right? Pretty easy. So why don't we use them? So think about all the fad diets out there and how do they conform to our national guidelines? What can we say about them? It's tough to define the fad diet effectively and to test them as there's so many variations as I've already alluded to. Um, and they're also quite restrictive um, and reduce compliance and therefore we can really only get really short term data on these types of fad diets. So I'm going to start with the fasting history. How many of you have tried or looked at the fasting diet? Good, okay, a couple. <laughs> Um, fasting diet's not new. It's been around since 1909, basically, um, and it was a concept started in looking at fasting strategies for cancer prevention in animals, and that's where it started. 
So there has been some really good clinical research in animal studies that have looked at cancer and fasting, and it has been shown that restriction of energy in animal models can reduce the incidence and rates of cancer. As you know with wellness, the, we can't make recommendations based on animal studies. So there has been progression through to 2005, 2000, where the alternate day fasting by um, the Varaday and her team have looked at um, a reduced intake one day and a normal intake the following day. And then Michelle Harvey and her team in the UK looked at a two-day fast diet, diet strategy as well. So they've done clinical substantiation trials where they take the, these types of dietary patterns into a clinical environment and test them on a population in a controlled way so we can identify and control some variables and make sure things are working well. Um, but quite often the, the clinical trials are around about six to 12 weeks. So the two main contributors to the fasting in humans are Krista Varaday and Michelle Harvey, and that's what I'll um, allude to today. Um, although Varaday and Harvey are the only two researchers to have published and substantiated these short-term fasting diets, there are actually 60 books out on the market. I did a quick Google search. It was daunting. It was frightening. It was, they just populate. I don't know if you've ever had a look for certain diet books and Mr. Wiki and Google. They're fantastic just to find out what's out in the common market. But 60 different books. It was quite fascinating. The protocols um, essentially that underpin these types of diets are restricting energy. So normally when you go through weight loss diets, you look at energy restriction on a day-to-day -day basis. These take it one step back and said, okay, on a day-to-day -day basis, it's harder to maintain a complete restriction on your diet for weight loss. So they've stood back and said, okay, so how can we make this diet more flexible for the individual? So they've looked at an overall restriction over a week by substantially restricting two days or every alternate day. So essentially the fasting diets will have a, a fasting day which will have around about 500 calories. So in comparison, a normal diet, you don't restrict, you eat normal, what we call ad libitum. You just consume what you would normally have. An alternate day fasting will have a 24-hour unrestricted or normal dietary intake pattern, followed by a 24-hour fast of 500 calories for females, 600 calories for men. Within that research, there was um, the fast needed to be from fresh fruits and vegetables and lean meats at 500 calories. Still had a caveat on what types of foods that you consumed in the studies, but not in the other publications, the other 58. The five and two, the five days unrestricted diet, eat what you would like. Um, and assuming that you go back to the guidelines as well, keeping that in mind. Um, and focused on two days of 500 calories and no carbs on those days. It wasn't as restrictive with the fats, um, but it did go back to the natural guidelines saying we would prefer to eat from these healthy food groups. Okay. So the bulk of the scientific evidence for, further, for the health benefits of intermittent fasting had come from animal studies. So the Longo Matson progressed it from 1900 and then we've taken it over from um, Michelle Harvey and Krista Varaday to 2005 to current times. So the intermittent fasting research here is based on the Varaday Harvey papers. So the popular myth for and why this was investigated around fasting is that the intermittent fasting is easy and doesn't require dietary changes. Um, it leads to body fat losses and muscle gain. and for weight loss, just count the calories. So that's what led it to um, intermittent fasting research, is that they wanted to be a flexible diet that anybody can do, but still achieve weight loss and good metabolic outcomes. The rationale of the research itself is we need to have better metabolic outcomes. So any time you look at a research paper on a diet or you look at a book, you look at the metabolic outcomes, because that's what underpins most of the research. Weight loss is always something we guide ourselves by, but we really want good metabolic outcomes. Um, and also the re rationale of the research to make sure that the intermittent fasting diets are easy and helpful to follow. So what can we say about the intermittent fasting regimes? They are, pot they are a potential alternative to daily restriction for weight loss in overweight and obese individuals. But the underpinning credential under that is it needs to be under supervision. If you're on any medications, we need to make sure that they're actually monitored quite well with the restriction process. It may have benefits to fat loss, but this was a short-term study and longer-term study and evaluation on muscle mass, as Velma alluded to. Weight loss is 
quite great to achieve, but if you're losing muscle mass along with that weight loss, you can have issues with um, gait speed, muscle integrity and, and full risks. So we don't want to do that. So longer term studies are needed, um, but they are beneficial in the short term. And these studies did show reduction of insulin resistance, reduction of total cholesterol, reduction of blood pressure. Um, but it does highlight in the study research that the background diet is as important as the fasting pathway. So you still need to be mindful of the foods that you eat. I'm going to move to the paleo diet now. And I got a few smiles there. Most people know the paleo. Um, so the paleo diet or the caveman diet, and this is where I found about eight different variables in the paleo diet. Um, so really the, this is, um, I mean, it, it gets so much media around paleo diet. I think just recently there was that release around paleo diet increasing weight. It was a, a mouse study, so it's not a human trial, so we can't make recommendations that that's actually the case. But it's interesting that we've now gone back to my studies and we'll probably see it progress into human trials. So nutrition is changing quite dramatically. Um, but it says that our paleo ancestors, so this is the premise of the paleo diet, that our paleo ancestors were fit, lean and healthy. They hunted and actively gathered for food. The foods they ate made them fit and lean. And the premise, again, of why it doesn't fit today is that the modern day is full of obesity, illness, autoimmune disease and cancer. Due to unhealthy lifestyles and food choices, our genes have not adapted to this intake. And that's what most of the hype is claiming, that we haven't adapted, we haven't evolved, and therefore we get stuck in the middle, but we can go and follow the paleo diet, get off the crutches, throw the can of coke away, and we can come lean and fit again. So around that, the paleo diet regime would look like this. And we're suggesting our ancestors ate only lean meats, nuts, fruit, mainly fruits that you can forage from, and they cut out all the processed and refined foods, which is very similar to what the dietary guidelines are saying, right? But the paleo diet um, also cut out these food groups. So the current trendy paleo diet suggests that we cut out dairy-based proteins and calciums. I'm not going to go into why we should keep them in because Belma's done a very good spiel on you know, the benefits of calcium and benefits of full fat, any types of dairy, and that you need to keep them into your diet. So I won't go into that. But cutting out the carbohydrate-based foods is of concern as well because you are cutting out the fibre, folate and low GI carbs. So you know as a diabetic you probably do need at least 50 grams of carbohydrate per day for glucose production to the brain. And that's the World Health Organisation have released a couple of years ago. So cutting out these foods aren't not only going to let go of important glucose for metabolism and brain function, we know what happens when you don't have enough fibre, right? So I won't go there. <laughs> but folate as well. So it, we also need just some good blood-borne multi, um, vitamins in our system as well. And folate is really well known for reduction of cancer risk. So when I started looking for studies within this area, there is a, um, a few portals around um, where they collect paleo-based um, studies, but I really couldn't find anything long-term. Everything, again, was short-term. But I did come across this one here in um, postmenopausal women at a two-year randomised control trial. The paleo diet was that they tested is very similar that I showed you, so cut out refined foods, had lean meats, um, healthy fats and oils, nuts and seeds and grains, which grains were out, um, cut out the dairy and it, basically it didn't show any greater, at, in the two year stage, it didn't show any greater body fat loss at six months, but sorry, it did show good fat loss at six months, but it wasn't sustained at two years. So short term effects of benefit can show a promise, but long term effects. And we all know with bone health, it's a long term outcome for osteoporosis and osteopenia. We need to monitor our bone health over time. It's not something we see within six months. And we did see the paleo diet did show a great overall reduction in triglycerides. Now we know triglycerides can actually be reduced by just reducing the amount of carbohydrates you do have in your diet, not by eliminating them. But no other differences of other metabolic measures were taken or um, shown in the long term. So for insulin resistance and so forth, um, there were no additional benefits of following a paleo diet when compared to a normal diet. 
So my final comments around the paleo diet really comes down to, OK, let's address our genes have not adapted to tolerate today's diet. DNA adapts to our environment relatively quickly, um, as this paper, Ruminothi, has de um, demonstrated. Through generations, it's, it's through the area of epigenetics. Our genome may not change, but our epigenetics and how our body adapts to the environment does change quite rapidly. And we do see that even with our gut health these days, when you see more people going towards more um, probiotics and so forth for gut health issues. So we do adapt quite rapidly. Paleo improves chronic disease, insulin resistance, diabetes and heart disease. It's one of their other claims. It does in the short term. And again, it's under supervision that you need to um, if you're ever going to attempt something like this. But it's not good for the long term. Um, it can be detrimental to bone health. And type 2 diabetes, you do need to exercise with that for it to be beneficial. And I think that's what they're going to find with the mouse study as well, is that it was very important to have exercise as part of a diet regime and to have that um, medical supervision as well. Their diet also, when I looked at it, and I actually did a little bit of homework and put the um, diet into a food package called Foodworks, which is a dietary analysis package where we can actually assess and analyse um, dietary nutrients or the dietary intake pattern and the nutrients that it provides. When I popped that into Foodworks and it suggested that it was a low-carbohydrate diet, I actually found that it provided 130 grams of carbohydrate for that test diet. That's the diabetes guidelines for to um, at, at have a minimum of 130 grams of carbohydrate a day is what the diabetes recommendations are anyway. Um, I think they might not have analysed it effectively in their study. And, but they only had 350 milligrams of dietary calcium where we need at least 800 a day for bone health as well. So that's another important factor to remember. So although not proven safe longer term, there are some positive aspects that we can take from here, remembering back to those dietary guidelines. The paleo diet does support some of the AGHE, but the paleo diet does support um, the high protein foods, the lean choices, the healthy fats are supported. Um, also to have you know lower carbohydrate intake is quite beneficial, and I'll show you that why in a moment. Um, and we're also making sure that we have the whole food choices and moving away from refined sugars, refined carbohydrates and processed foods. So they're all key messages that are set in the dietary guidelines as well. Okay, I'm coming into now the um, higher protein diets. So I didn't break the protein diets down to high protein, low carb, high protein, low fat, high fat, otherwise we're here for the whole next five hours. Um, but what I have found is a couple of papers that indicated, um, well, I, I'll step back for a minute, a meta-analysis is a summary of a range of research that is done in, in common literature, or sorry, in um, peer-reviewed literature, so in scientific areas. There's um, scientists that will publish individual papers. A meta-analysis was where someone scoops up those papers and takes it back and analyses them, pulls out the data and pulls all the data together for a meta-analysis or a big analysis of the data looking for trends. And they use strict criteria. You can ask Vilma about this. <laughs> She's my boss. <laughs> she makes me do it. <laughs> um, but you do a meta-analysis and you pull the data and you actually look at current trends and where you can make some recommendations. So it's one of the first line areas where you can possibly make some recommendations if the human trials are done in a demonstrable way where you can make that recommendation sound. So this meta-analysis um, is a summary of the evidence of high-protein diets. And I've got a couple here. So this one is, and I think this is Witcherly. So this is under um, a group of studies done under a 12-month period. And this is what we found. So when we grouped the data, oh, this is what Tom and his team found. Um, and it's published in the Clinical of Nutrition. So they found that the study, each study duration was on an average about 12 weeks, so about three month studies. Um, but they did range between four and 52 weeks in study total study duration. The mean age range was between 20 and 59, both males and females. And the achieved diets, so the patterns that were prescribed, but the diets that they achieved was a high protein diet of about 6,500 kilojoules and a um, standard protein diet of 6,300 kilojoules. So we would call that isocaloric or same um, energy intake. The relative protein for high protein was 1.25 grams per kilogram of body weight per day. 
compared to a standard protein diet, which is dietary recommendations of around about 7.7 grams of protein per kilogram per day. So there were a nice deviation between the two recommendations so you can see an effect. Because you don't want them to be the same because you're not going to see you know, which is going to work better than the other ones. But you want it to be isochloric or the same calories so you can actually say that variable is out of the, the equation. It can be down to the protein. The macronutrient composition. So it was 31% um, protein on average, the 4%, 42% um, carbohydrate and 28% total fat. So again, firmly within the guidelines. The standard protein was 18% protein, 57% carbohydrate and 25% total fat, again, within the guidelines. This meta-analysis looked at studies over the year mark, so we looked at studies long term. So one of the biggest things about looking at safety and effectiveness is that we need longer term data, so longer term over 12 months is pretty much why we're looking at the two different variations here. So the high protein, lower carb diet to standard protein, higher carb diet over that period of 12 months. And this one was done by um, Peter Clifton's team, um, I believe at the time it was at UniSA. And the prescribed diets were very low in carbohydrate, almost ketogenic, a bit like the Atkins style diet. So high protein of 20% of total energy as protein and lower protein was under 20%. The study duration here was 52 to 208 weeks, so longer term up to four years, and the mean age was quite comparable to the last um, under 12 month type of range, so mean age of 22 to 62, male and female. The number of studies included in this one was a lot larger, over 3,492 individual participants were actually within the cluster of these studies, and the outcomes that they measured here were changes in body weight, body composition, and cardiometabolic risk factors such as your cholesterol, blood glucose levels, and so forth, and HbA1c. So the rationale for these for increasing protein in diets is quite well known now. So we know that increased protein can it is associated with um, reduced body weight, um, in particular fat mass. We also know that a higher protein diet, especially for the elderly as well, retains fat-free mass during weight loss and may increase acute protein synthesis in the absence and presence of resistance exercise. So if you're not doing intense resistant exercise, still having a higher protein diet is quite beneficial for the body and muscle mass. It has been shown now that it retains a high protein diet can retain bone mass during weight loss as well, whereas previous hypotheses were around increased protein in diets can actually leach the calcium out of the bone. That would have probably been about maybe eight years ago that was the hypothesis. It's actually not true, so that's been chose, um, changed to say high protein diets don't leach out the calcium. Um, if high protein um, can also induce fullness and give you a reduced hunger signal, so it can control appetite over a period of time. And normally that protein distribution in the day needs to be between breakfast, lunch and dinner. So ha not having it in one big sitting, but having it in small intervals throughout the day can actually control appetite well. Um, and it does increase thermogenesis and blunts the fall of resting energy expenditure. So thermogenesis is the food goes into your body and it makes your body work a little bit harder. So you increase your metabolism also slightly. So there are rationales behind actually increasing protein within the diet. So what they did find, and this is the under one year findings, is that high protein diets have a greater mean weight loss of just under a kilo, and it was proven to be significant in that data of under one year. And keeping in mind the mean was around about 12 weeks. It had a greater reduction in triglycerides, again, higher protein, probably compensating with a, probably are compensating with a lower carbohydrate diet. And there was a preservation of resting energy expenditure, but these were only shown in four studies, so it's not really meaningful. They did have reports on greater satiety in the three of the five studies, but inconsistent methodologies were shown. So again, the data is still promising, but it's still not conclusive that this is the way we all should go. But they did say under the 12 months that there was no difference in total LDL, HDL, systolic or diastolic blood pressure or fasting glucose or insulin. The meta-analysis for the findings of one year and over 
showed that higher protein diets had a mean greater weight loss of less, just under half a kilo. So as you transition through longer term periods, you do get recidivism. So you do regain some of the weight and you do regain some of the um, ab abnormal metabolic parameters. Um, they had a greater reduction in triglycerides, but not as great as the ones in the shorter term. Um, and greater reduction in fasting insulin. There was no difference in fat mass, total cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, systolic or diastolic blood pressure, fasting glucose or insulin, HbA1c or C-reactive protein. So again, the standard diet versus the high protein diet, overall benefits were quite min minimal, but there are some minor benefits there. So the limitations really and what we need to focus on is um, keeping people in the study. If it's a diet that's too restrictive, and this goes to the fad diets as well, if the diet plan is too restrictive and it doesn't, isn't something that you feel you can do for the rest of your life, it's likely that you won't, so dropout rates do occur. After the first six months of the intervention, most studies displayed the poor compliance, so they might have been staying within the study, but we take dietary measures, so we might be getting food recalls and also biomarkers for compliance, and we did find people were just not sticking to the rest restricted plan. Um, high protein diets have good short term benefits and that's probably easy to say, yet on the short term everything works. Okay, So I'm not saying fasting worked um, on the, in a short term period, high protein diets work in a short term period. Um, again, under supervision, but it's difficult to dis distinguish the effectiveness for the higher protein diet over a longer period of time, which is over two years. So that's it on the high protein diet. So um, hopefully I haven't got the energy levels down too much because I'll get some good news a bit later. Um, but what I want to talk about now is, so where does this fit with the later CSRO diabetic diet? Have you all seen in the media or heard about it, about the t CSRO? Yeah. Um, I won't be able to go into too much detail about the science in the program and I will be around after if you want to have a little bit chat to myself and Velma who was also involved. Um, but the diet composition of, um, that we prescribed, so we did test two diets, but the one um, that's gained popularity in the media at the moment is this one here, where we prescribed 15% of the total energy intake um, associated with carbohydrates, 28% to protein, and 58% to fat, total fats. And they were monounsaturated fat and polyunsaturated fat were the predominant fat sources within that um, diet. So this is the study design, and we did go for two years, and we did routinely, and there's a couple of you in the crowd that I know have participated in this trial actively and all the way through, thank you. Um, but we did compare them, and we did follow them up, every individual, for the first 12 months, um, two weekly, then monthly, and then monthly thereafter, after the 12 months. So they were coming back to the clinic quite rigorously um, and getting dietary intervention, and they were getting exercise, and also that we had a clinical endocrinologist on board to monitor all the medication changes throughout the time as well. So it was intensive, and it was quite thorough, and um, so we'd call that quite a rigorous scientific study. So we did compare that dietary pattern to a what we would call normal diabetic practice, which had a high carbohydrate load of 53% total carbohydrates, and these were low GI foods as well, so we didn't put high refined foods into the other diet. We kept the same sort of carbohydrate choices, low GI um, grains into the diet patterns. And the protein was 17%, so a bit of a drop there. And the total fats were around about 30%. So they did receive, like I said down there, they did over the 104 weeks receive um, counselling and exercise and education around food choices as well was involved in that and mindful eating strategies. The exercise was pretty intense as well. It was actually strength training, I should mention that. So it wasn't um, going for a walk or it wasn't jumping on a cycle and pedalling and having a chat. It was actually quite intense strength training exercise, which I think a lot of people were quite surprised that they had the capability to get up and move their muscles like they had during that study. These are the food profiles of both treatment diets. You can see on the right-hand side the low-carbohydrate, low-saturated fat um, diet, both of these I'm showing you the 6,000 kilojoule template, so the isocaloric nature of the diets. So the same calories, just different food choices. Um, you can see the highlighted in blue. They're the foods that differed between... Glennis, you're probably seeing this for the first time. <laughs> the foods did different in portions, but the types are still there. So 
common belief is that a low carbohydrate diet, you cut out all carbohydrates. You can see in our low carbohydrate diet, we still had cereal, um, we still had crisp breads, we still had dairy, and we had a lot of nice vegetables. Just the total of that in that prescription was around about 50 grams of total carbohydrates. So we didn't cut it out completely. We still enabled carbohydrate consumption. Um, and you'd be happy to see there's 65 grams of nuts, almonds and pecans to get the right monounsaturated fat composition as well. The high carbohydrate diet was predominantly more carbohydrate rich, but still fit within the guidelines of 130 to 200 grams of carbohydrate per day. Um, the meat variation there, you can see 150 grams of raw weight beef, fish or chicken for an evening meal versus 80 grams of raw meat, meat fish or chicken for a meal. And the high carbohydrate diet was actually intermittent with a legume or a vegetarian based meal as well as a normal meat mate based meal. And um, the high carbohydrate diet or the standard practice were able to use rice and pasta in the meal and we had no carbohydrate based foods or no significant carbohydrate based foods for the evening meal in the low carb. And you can see on the bottom there was two standard drinks of wine or optional per week allowable as well. The finding from that trial was really interesting and um, both of the diets actually didn't show any difference between the weight loss rates. Both lost weight. Both lost and at two, 10 years sorry, at 10 years, I wish, at two years, they maintained 10% of total body weight that was lost on average. So no big difference for weight management. The low carb, low saturated fat diet had more favorable effects on lipid profiles, but in particular, the triglycerides dropped more dramatically than compared to the higher car carbohydrate diet, as you would predict with the lower carbohydrate consumption, but it was quite significant. Um, the glycemic control and attenuating glucose fluctuations it, that was the, the novel part. We put continuous glucose monitoring sensors on in the individuals over a period of time. And I don't know if anyone knows what the continuous glucose monitoring system is. It's basically a little biosensor that sits subcutaneously under the tissue, just under the fat tissue, and it reads blood glucose levels on a continuous day-to-day -day basis. So it can look at how your body responds or your glucose responds to the food that you eat. So we look at those as exclusions after a meal. So most of you would take postprandial blood glucose tests, this will look at all of those patterns in between your blood finger prick tests. Um, the novel low carb, low saturated fat diet also had favorable therapeutic potential. It, we did see a lot of medications reduced more effectively in the low carb diet than they did in the standard practice. And that was the point of difference for this trial. It wasn't always about weight loss, it was about the metabolic outcomes and the reduction of medications. And again, I will point out that we did have a wonderful endocrinologist supervising that intensively over the two years and was there to counsel everybody. Because once you start a low carbohydrate diet, if you're on medications, even blood pressure medications, you do go through dramatic changes and it can be quite dangerous if it's not supervised or done appropriately. So we did find that the incorporation of a low carbohydrate, low saturated fat eating plan with a comprehensive lifestyle management program can magnify the benefits of improving both acute and chronic glycemic control, reducing glycemic variability, which is the ups and downs, and enhancing um, heart disease and type two diabetes management. So the next steps, we don't have this program available at the moment. It was a clinical trial. Our next steps is to bring it into the community. So it's a watch this space at the moment. Um, there is a bit of media hype and people wanting this information now. Unfortunately, it's not ready to hand out in a publishable form, but it is something that we'll be recruiting for in the near future. So coming back to summarising um, how do all these diets conform to the acceptable micronutrient ranges, I just popped this table up together. The, high, the reds are really the ones that are outside the range of acceptable micronutrients. Um, I haven't put the fasting up here because that didn't have any predictable um, boundaries on their nutrient profiles. Um, but you can see the Atkins and the Paleo are effectively outside the acceptable ranges mostly. And even the CSRO total will be... Um, the diets are also outside of these boundaries. Um, how these are all fad diets? There is a sustainable literature mounting on long-term benefits, um, such as what we did with the type 2 diabetes trial and also Manny Noakes' previous trial in total wellbeing. I thought you were waving to me. <laughs> um, 
But it's, in, it's what this highlights to us is that not one diet fits everybody, and I think that's a common term we ne we know. But where do we go from there? And the important part is is probably more so to look at individual responsiveness. Look at what isn't the norm. What diet is best fit for you is the way we should be approaching it. Okay, looking at um, you know your metabolic and genomic kind of biomarkers that predict what diet you would be better on. There are people that are better on a lower carbohydrate diet, and there's people that will gain weight on a low carbohydrate diet. Finding out where you fit within that range and what diet would be most appropriate to you would be something that would would be fantastic out there in the in the um, in the public arena. And I guess that's one thing that we'd like to work on in the future as well. So it's not quite there, but it's something you can discuss with your practitioners, your dietitians, your exercise physiologists, and stay abreast of the information and adapt that to you personally. Do I have time to go through a couple of food trends? Okay, I'm just going to finish on about two slide, three slides um, around fad food trends. I would be remiss of me to not talk about the gluten-free. Now I've raised it in the beginning. <laughs> Um, there is this big trend of people going gluten-free in the absence of actually having celiac disease, and it's perpetuated by really, um, you know, the, the gut bloating and also just the feeling of malaise and the health consciousness increasing. But what's happening out there as well is that the food supply chain are perpetuating that belief as well. So you see more and more gluten-free products come onto the market. The common question around this is really about, you know, is a gluten-free diet better than a normal diet, it, not thinking of the, um, the celiac. Obviously, it's going to be better. A gluten-free diet is much, much safer for a celiac patient. But um, what we did find when I looked at a study, uh, it was the, um, a group in the States that looked at a gluten-free diet compared to a normal diet. And they looked at comparing the same sort of parameters we normally compare, same sort of average male-female ratio, um, isocaloric kind of dietary pattern. And they found those that were on a self or a, a libitum type of diet consumption pattern ate more ca total calories in a gluten-free diet than they did on a non-gluten-free diet. And they also had a reduced fibre intake and a reduced folate intake in a gluten-free diet as well. And really that comes back, if you actually look on what is gluten-free, what is not gluten-free, are your breads and, breads and cereals contain wheat? They're definitely going to be gluten. But your meats, your vegetables, aren't your gluten-free containing foods? So they should be eating most of those. So what are they compensating or what are they taking out of their diet to become gluten-free are the processed foods. So a lot of the gluten-free fads are really going into the processed types of crackers that are on the shelf or the biscuits that are on the shelf for the cereals. So it, it's become a bit of a perpetual myth that um, I think I missed out on here, but the overall reduction of carbohydrates will probably be the thing that will have the greatest benefit in this population on gut health than it is actually around cutting out gluten. And there's other questions around, is it actually the wheat, not the gluten in the food as well? Yeah, go backwards. The last one I want to touch on here is superfoods. It's a term that's quite usefully um, recognised or used in social media or in common media. Um, what is a superfood? It really is a, a, to describe a food with a high photonutrient, antioxidant, fibre or a micronutrient that's different to the rest of the foods within that group that may relate to health benefits. And um, Velma alluded to the omega-3 in the mufa oils and anti-inflammatory properties. That could be taken as a superfood, but it's not. It's just a food that provides a health benefit. There's no legal definition for the term superfood, and it is over-marketed. So when you're reading the food labels, try not to be taken in by those terms. Have a look at the health need that you have and whether it's going to be of benefit to you. And most of the foods, again, when you look at superfoods, it's fruits and vegetables. And the common foods there are broccoli, um, soy, wheat, grass, and noni juice has been around for a while. So superfoods general claims relate to anti-cancer activity, anti-aging, insulin management and boost, immune boosting. There's a lot more around de dementia and ageing and so forth. There's limited clinical evidence. There's a lot of animal studies coming through, but still few clinical trials. Um, there was one on goji berries, um, which was focusing more on the antioxidant constituent, not the actual totality of the food. So that's really important to know what they're actually measuring. Is it the total food or is it a nutrient within a food that they're testing? 
Um, human research is still limited. And the ones that are in human trials and they're on short term have shown some interactions with medication. So if you are taking any superfoods that, that can be potent in a certain nutrient, it's important to go to the pharmacy or where you're buying them and ask, is it going to interact with medications? Because some of these things do. So I guess your take home messages for Jane, what I want you to remember is, when a remithophad comes from a trusted person, we don't usually question it, as you didn't probably in the beginning. So I want you to start thinking, who's spruiking this information? Where is it coming from? What is the evidence? How many people has it been tested on? And does it suggest avoiding whole food groups? And just start building up your repertoire of knowledge. Um, we are in a changing nutrition environment, so the information will come out quite rapidly. So um, do call and just yeah, talk to your trusted advisors like your Diabetes SA team. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. The question down the front here was, can we explain triglycerides in relation to cholesterol? When you go to the doctors and you're having a cholesterol test, it's normally called a lipid test. And in that lipid test, you have um, different ranges on there. The doctor may go through with them. It's called total cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, HDL, LDL. Um, triglycerides are a form of cholesterol that forms the sum of total cholesterol in the blood. And quite often, it's, um, triglycerides are increased by consuming high refined sugars, carbohydrates, and also alcohol can trigger the increase of, cholesterol, of the triglycerides. It's a detrimental um, fatty acid, so it can cause some of those um, inflammations and atherosclerosis has been associated with high triglycerides as well. Oh, okay, yeah. The, the, it went on to elaborate, um, the question went on to elaborate around um, being told you've got a good total cholesterol level, but you might have a disparate cholesterol level underneath, which is the different type of constituents. You can have a good co total cholesterol level, but it comes back to what Velma said about getting the right fatty acids, because that will show into the bloods as well. Um, so you can have a good total cholesterol or a low total cholesterol, but your HDLs or your triglycerides, triglycerides or your lipids may be out of their own individual reference ranges and you can target those types of um, fatty acids as well or cholesterol components. Any other questions? Uh, there's been uh, a lot in the media, and in fact it seems to be more and more um, each week, about the negative effects of fructose as a component of glucose. So is sugar just carbohydrate or is there something in this anti-fructose movement? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, fructose is definitely a sugar and it's part of the carbohydrate family. Um, fructose has a lower metabolism than your normal refined sugars, so it can be better for you. Fructose is naturally occurring in fruit as well. So I think the issue is more around where the fructose comes from rather than fructose itself. If fructose has been added to, um, and most times it can be added to a processed food, then it's going to have a detrimental effect because it's actually in a processed food that doesn't have all the other positive benefits of fruit, for example. If fructose is in fruit, which is naturally occurring with the fibre and other micronutrients within there and a whole piece of fruit, it's, it's quite okay. As long as you're not eating you know, six apples in a sitting, you're being sensible and eating that one. Does that help? Hi. What effect is this on diet? What effect is, sorry, blood type. Blood type. Okay. Wow. Um, that's an interesting, because um, there was a, a book, I don't know if most of you have read Peter Adamo's um, blood type diet book, probably back, way back. He basically designed a diet, it was a fad diet again, I'll be honest, um, around blood type and types of foods that you can choose. We're more moving towards more the genomic, kind of epigenetic and microbiome kind of fingerprinting now, not just the blood type. So we're looking at, not we, all researchers are looking at um, the effects of those parameters, not just blood, on the foods and the diet choices that we make. So it's, it's a new area, but blood type doesn't have a significant itself, doesn't have an impact on, yeah, the type of diet we should choose. 
sorry, that cut that. Hi, um, a couple of months ago, my GP said to go onto a FODMAP diet. Okay. So I've yep. got a twofold question. One, is that a fad diet? And two, yeah. originally it suggested it's a six weekly thing, but then towards the end of the six weeks, I said, no, actually, you can stay on it, but there's also that thought of it's not that good for someone who's a diabetic. So have you got any? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, it's more of a clinical question, so it's good to take that question to your dietitian. Um, FODMAPs are forms of um, sugars or types of fermentable fibres in your in carbohydrates, sorry, in your diet, and they come under um, the oligosaccharides and monounsaccharides type of components. It's not a fad diet, it's, but that's why I go back and say it's a clinical diet. It's been cl clinically tested by a group in, um, I believe it's Monash University, and also Sue Shepherd was one of the PhDs that continued that diet, looking at the effects of those types of foods on gut health. And certain foods or carbohydrate intolerances in individuals, can those foods can have an impact. So it's not a fad diet. There is a six-week regime, but it's probably best to talk to your dietitian about that or no, yeah, a specialised dietitian. Yeah. Um, you didn't really mention much about sugar in people's diets. And I just wanted to share that when I first found out I had type 2 diabetes, um, the doctor said I might have to have insulin injections and I thought, no way, I'm not going to have inject myself with insulin. And I, I went to the shops and I bought myself a big jar of hermocetus and I cut out all the sugar from my diet and saved it just for very special occasions like Christmas and Easter. And I lost 10 kilos and... Now I can fit into my jeans again. <laughs> Good. <laughs> and, well and the other day I picked up a, a 10 kilo bag of rice from under the sink and I thought all this weight I was carrying around and since I've cut out sugar from my diet it's just improved my health so much more and, and my blood sugar is under seven now. Oh, well done. Yeah. I just that is fantastic. Share it with everyone. Yeah. <laughs> That is fed. I, I was going to cover sugar, but I cut some of it out to cover the diabetes diet. But yeah, well done. Any other questions? What's the known juice? Yeah, it's a, um, basically it's a plant-based type of juice that they put together in a super concentrated level to provide different types of antioxidants. And they're saying it's like, um, and there's lots of these types of juices out there that are promoted as superfoods where they're concentrated shots of antioxidants or polyphenols with a claim associated to it to ha actually have anti-cancer or anti-diabetes um, or chronic disease type of um, claims to them that aren't substantiated. So Noni Juice has been around for quite a long time. Is it something that we should be... No, sorry, it's something I probably wouldn't be recommending. Yeah. Sorry. Um, can I just say, um, ask you about the Newcastle study that was done in the UK? Do you know that one? Which one? What was it? Um, they, for two months, um, they were restricted to 800 calories a day, and they lost this tremendous amount of weight. Um, I'm just wondering how safe it was. Yeah, 800 calories. I've. Um one of, part of my role at CSRO is to look at dietary modelling and pattern modelling and trying to get a diet that's at its lowest level but still nutritionally complete is quite hard. And, I mean, you can get it around about 900 calories, but it's very, very restrictive. 800 calories, I hazard to guess that there's a lot of nutrient risks that's associated with going that low, and it's not sustainable long-term, A, because it's so restrictive in how much energy... Two months, yeah. Short term again, it's be one of those, yeah, short term benefits. Yep, sorry. These dox, detox things are advertised. Yes. Yeah, do I like them or do I not? Mm. Um, <laughs> again, it falls into that fad food trend, not the food diet. So the detox poses um, their claims associated with um, cleaning out the liver, because the liver detox is probably one of the most familiar ones. Um, and breaking down fatty acids. Really what you're doing when you take a lemon detox is fasting. 
it's not so much the potion and the lotion that you take, it's more the fasting pathway that you take when you're taking that drink. If you did a, par a partial fasting regime, as I talked about earlier, with some water, it had the same sort of effect. So I wouldn't recommend detoxes at all. Sorry. Just the last question, thank you. Um, I just wondered if there are any health benefits of fasting, say once a month or something like that, for a fast for a couple of meals? Don't eat anything. It'll be interesting to see. I haven't seen any literature on that. I don't know if Vilma know. But it'll be interesting to see because there are some um, studies coming out. I mean, fasting is a popular trend at the moment to identify whether it is safe, effective. Because if, you know, from a dietitian's perspective, if we can increase diet flexibility and get a good outcome metabolically, and fasting is the idea, it would be great to have some sort of um, diet like that that somebody can do. But I haven't seen the literature, if there's anything. Sorry. I think that's it. Thank you.